Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, and I think we have a few late arrivals here, but I'll get started. And uh, this session is recorded, so you'll be able to get the replay and share it with others um, after this, this session. Uh, today, we're going to talk about kind of a, something that has been developing really strongly um, kind of in the overlay uh, world over the past 12 months, which is um, teaching and teaching immersive media. And uh, so what I wanted to do today is sh share with everybody some of the, um, the evolutions that I think are um, transforming the way we're able to now teach immersive media in the classroom. Some of the barriers uh, that have fallen or about to fall in terms of content creation that I think are changing the workflows, changing the ability to produce content and have students participate, you know, in creation of content versus being just passive, you know, user of uh, immersive content. And then share what some of the universities are doing, um, even high schools, uh, to take advantage of um, that you know, that new technology. Um, so let me start by just sharing my screen and I'm just gonna project a few slides to just illustrate um, some of the things that we've seen in the past 12 months. First thing I wanna say is that there has been um, really an acceleration of the number of organizations that we've seen um, exploring augmented reality, not just, you know, as a technology, but really as a communication medium. So I think that we're seeing a shift that it's not just about the tech or, you know, the special effect or the gaming side. In fact, if anything, I think this is like fading away and becoming really unattractive. But I think there's a new wave of exploration around utilizing the medium to engage the public, to communicate, uh, to communicate locally, so kind of in space or in a specific physical context. And all these organizations here, they're just a sample of organization that we've seen at Havale, you know, create content, deploy activations, um, investigate what they could do to engage the public um, through, through augmented reality and more generally immersive medium. And I'm going to talk about some of them uh, I see uh, some of you of your logo on here are here. I see uh, Jay, who runs the Boston Fashion Week, which just concluded, was very successful. So Jay, um, I may invite you to say a few words about, about what you're doing as well, but you know there might be some others who want to chime in. In a nutshell, um, here's the problem we've been kind of facing, or we've been hearing about when it came to the participation of the general public or content creators with regard to immersive, immersive media, but specifically augmented reality. The very first problem is that until recently, the content creation process was too complex for most content creators. And the result of that became very costly. So, whatever you wanted to produce with AR was this huge endeavor where you had to have very advanced skills to be able to produce content in Unity, to put together that content into an app, to do revisions, to, to understand AR, you know, as a, as a technique. So it was a huge barrier to participation. As you're going to see in the example I'm going to give you, this has largely disappeared. But I think there's still this belief out there that AR is very complicated, it's very complex, and therefore the barrier is too high. The second issue, uh, which is that even if you produce content to be able to share it, there isn't really any place to put it. There is no browser that can really do AR in a kind of in a way that would work across devices. Um, and web AR is still very, you know, still very young. It's, it's not ready. You can't really do AR in a browser still today. I mean, you can do some things, but not a whole lot. And it's very much preventing, I think it has been preventing uh, the creation of content because it's very difficult to package it up, to distribute it. You have to build an app, you have to put it in a store, you have to wait for Apple to approve. And 
you have to do it on Android and you have to do it on Apple. So, so there's a lot of issues around distribution of those experiences. And the last thing, which I think is more of an infrastructure problem is that AR makes a lot of sense when it relates to a context. It could be a thing that you attach the content to. It could be a place that you attach the content to. And for that to exist, you need to have a way to persist that content. You need a place to store it. And it could be a cloud service. It could be, but something has to exist that the public could query to find out what you've placed at a location. That can't just be on the phone. Otherwise, it's you know we have to change the app every time you change a piece of content. So, so there was a lack of infrastructure. What people sometimes call the um, anchor cloud, or you know some kind of a service that's able to s store content not just on web pages but on physical locations or attached to physical attributes. So, when we started Havale, these were the problems we were hearing, and that's been our focus with Havale to try to reduce those barriers. Some of them, they were reduced because of the evolution of the space. Some of them, they're because of technology we provided, but all together, it kind of provides now a complete different level of um, capabilities for publishing content in physical location. So for those of you who are familiar with Havale, you probably know this. For those of you who are never heard you know, about Havale, the way to think about it is that it's a publishing platform that's designed for immersive media. So it's not a coding platform. It's not an SDK. It's a way. Uh, it's a system for publishing to physical location, just like you would publish on YouTube. And but in this particular case, you're publishing in the physical world. Um, the way you do this, and I'm ju just going to do a quick demo. So if you have your, you know, have your phone ready next to your your uh, desk here because we're just going to do a little test and you can just, you know, yeah. scan and see, you know, kind of an end-to-end -end process. But essentially, uh, you're going to record content, create content with images, with not just, you know, 3D tools, but with traditional 2D video animation tools and so on. I'll get back to that in a second. Then you upload this content into what we call a space, a space is your publishing unit, if you want, and you deploy that space at a physical location and you decide if there is a restriction on access or not. And on the right is what the public would see when they hold their phone up. Here it's by the Shaw Memorial in Boston. They would see a reenactor talking about the, the history of the, the Shaw 54th uh, Regiment. Um, and that's kind of where it starts. So you go from here to here, in a pure publishing no-code workflow. So that allows a whole different set of participants to actually create content uh, without having to understand the underpinnings of how this gets turned into meshes and renderers and God knows what, you know, some of the technical aspects of making this possible. So in Havale, one of the first thing that we've expanded this year, and I think that is, really transforming how people can participate is the range of content that you can bring to the table. So you can bring 2D images, which is very effective for anything that has to do with historical content, for instance, right? So if you have historical photographs, you place them in the right location, you have an instant connection between content and, and location that's very powerful experience. You can have green screen videos um, that you can produce using you know, a phone, uh, HD recording in front of a, you know, portable studio like you saw in the, in the previous um, um, scenario. Uh, this could be also content created by students. For instance, uh, Colburn in Los Angeles um, has produced a, has recorded a quintet, an entire quintet of students performing a piece in front of green screen and they place that performance in front of their, um, they're building the main building uh, on Grand Avenue, for instance, just as a as a way to for the public to to see and kind of discover some of the the talents uh, of the students. As you walk by this big building, you hold your phone up and you can you can see a performance from from some students, for instance. Um, spatial audio has been a big piece, also of you know the 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 experiences that we've seen this year. 
Uh, you can create special audio from regular audio. So you can bring an MP3, which everybody can produce. And then you have a piece of audio that is specialized. That means you can walk around the scene. And if you wear headphones, you're going to hear sounds coming from different direction. Another big uh, piece of content 360. So you can bring 360 images and 360 videos, and they get transformed in Hubble into a portal that you step into, like a door that you step in. And when you step in, you're in another, you're in the middle of that, that sphere, if you want. So again, that's been, this, these are very, you know, the price, the complexity of producing 360 photos has also completely transformed. So it's a lot easier today. I mean, every everybody can find, you can even rent them. You can rent them at your local library, schools have them. So it's very easy to produce this type of content. It, it is very powerful. Another area that has transformed a lot in the past 18 months is 3D scanning. So it used to be that if you wanted to create a, a 3D model, you had to use something called photogrammetry. So you would take photos, many photos of a piece, and then you would feed that into a software that would restitch this and it would run for a couple of hours or more, and it would produce a model. And this model would be textured just like you're seeing here, for instance. You would create like a full volumetric capture of an object. Now with a regular iPhone uh, or, you know, kind of a mid range iPhone, I would say, even without a LIDAR camera, you can now do 3D captures directly from your phone. And it's almost real time. So within a few minutes, you can capture a piece because there's a lot of computational power on the phone. The cameras are very good. And Apple has exposed some of their photogrammetry API in their middleware in the operating system. So that means now that you start to have apps that can produce these 3D scans. Again, this is this is very recent. That is also very transformative because the production of those apps, those pieces was very complex and it has, has become very simple. Now there's still optimization you can make you still want to arrange them, compose something with them, but these are very important factor. The other factor that has compounded this is that there is an emerging standard called GLTF, which is like a JPEG. You know, remember when the web started, there were, you know, all kinds of image formats and then came JPEG and everybody standardized on JPEG. It was compressed. It was easy to share um, images on screens. The same thing is happening with those 3D scan, this 3D model. There's a, an emerging standard called GLTF, which many tools can generate. And uh, so that means now that because of that, all this complexity of transforming models and this gazillion number of formats we had for representing 3D models is now, they're still here, they still have their own niches, but when it comes to AR, when it comes to VR, immersive media, there is a pivot format that's becoming almost the norm. And it's very likely that any new tool is going to be able to ingest GLTF and create GLTF. So again, it means that this 3D asset that you're creating, not only they're much easier to import, export, but they're also more reusable. So you could do a VR project, you could do an AR project. Uh, you can reuse these assets across the board because of this, this pivot format that's now available. So it's worth investing in them. And um, you can also bring 2D and 3D animation. In fact, GLTF supports animation. So all this gives, I think it's, it's basically transforming the ability of uh, people learning about immersive media to produce, to import, export content. And in fact, all these are a subset of tools that are regularly used to produce content to be used, for instance, through Hubble. So people use, obviously, Photoshop and After Effects for anything that's you know, video animation related, but also things like character animator, right? So we had, for an example of a, a treasure hunt that had characters that were created with illustrator pieces, so little people, basically. And character animator gives you the ability to import one of those characters, and it opens up your camera, and as you speak, it will automatically do the movements of the mouth and and animate those characters for you and produce a video that you can then bring into Hubble as a you know, green screen video that you can use as a character. So the ability to produce a character that's you know, very creative and, and, and where, where 
this character can interact with the public, again, these things are available today and they can allow the creation of content very, very easily. Tilt brush is another example. Tilt brush is, is a tool that allows you to, to paint in VR. So if you paint in VR, you have a certain creative freedom in terms of how you, you compose your piece in, 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 you know, in a kind of volumetric fashion. Tilt brush can generate GLTF. So now you can produce a piece and have a piece in point to Havala. And that's one of the pieces, for instance, that at the Boston Fashion Week, one of the um, the artist uh, that was featured, who was featured, uh, created a piece, you know, a, 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 some kind of garment in VR that was then presented um, on the uh, Boston Fashion Week channel for the public. So again, what I want to emphasize here is what was true even two years ago in terms of the complexity of this workflow is completely changing. It's changing very fast. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Havala, I just want to mention also, you may be thinking, okay, well, you know, I put this content on my channel. How do people find it? Well, there are three ways to, for people to find content. One is that when you publish content and you geolocate it, it's going to create a map for the public, just like Pokemon Go, right? So the public is going to be able to go to your channel and the homepage is this map. So if you want content to be geofenced, then they can follow the map and kind of go to the activation that you've that you've placed. The other option is just simple QR code. Every activation that you deploy, every space has a QR code, right? So you can use the code to um, uh, you can use the code to um, um, jump straight to an, to an experience without uh, requiring the map. And then finally, you have URLs, same as the QR code. It's the same concept is just a link that you can send to someone, you can put in a newsletter, you can text it, um, and then people receive this link, they tap this link, could be on a web page, it will open the experience in Hovelay. If they don't have the Hovelay app, it will insert the installation process in the middle, and it will open the app on the experience that, that they started with. So it's very streamlined from the standpoint of, um, of that experience. And the Havala app acts as we have this kind of universal browser that you can use to display content. It's a it looks like a browser. It's very lightly branded. There's no signups. It's just just a, a way for people to enter your experiences and interact with them. All right. So I just want to before I jump into what some of the experiences uh, um, show you some of the experiences that are out there. Um, and there's some questions here. I think we'll get back to the question. We'll have plenty of time to discuss and and you know answer questions. I just want this to be another 15 minutes, and then we'll jump to questions. Um, I'm just going to go to my channel again. For those of you that have not seen Havale, uh, this is the publishing tool, which is a web-based tool. Which again, if you're in academia, it's, it means there's no installation required. Uh, you sign up on your channel, and then you can see all your spaces and see where they are and when they were activated last. Um, I'm just gonna create a space now just for the sake of our little demo here and I'll put in, in, in Boston. Here we go. So I'm just gonna do a space that covers the entire Boston area. And I'm going to say that this is only available for one day until tomorrow. So, um, that's my container. So now I've got my space. Now I'm going to add content. So when you add content, again, you're going to see the same types as what we were seeing earlier. Just want to mention also that for those who are into Unity, that you can also, we have a Unity exporter. So you can take Unity assets, or Unity game objects, export those, and then just bring them into Havala. So it's a very quick process to iterate with stuff that you're doing in, in Unity. Um, again, this is for more advanced use cases, things like uh, particle effects and things of that nature. Um, let me just start with a simple image. So I'm just going to go and uh, pick an image from my image library here. Let me just take this little welcome sign. Okay, I'm just going to use this. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to say that it's movable. It can be rotated by wherever sees it and can be rescaled by whoever sees it. 
and I'm going to place it in front of whoever watches it. So within Boston, whenever somebody enters this experience, the content is going to unfold in relation to them versus in relation to an external mark, like a, a mural, a facade, um, a card or something like that. And here I have my little sizing avatar here that helps me kind of figure out the height and the position and so on. So I'm just going to place this let me place it a little bit here to the right. I'm going to rotate this sign a little bit. And if I save this and you scan the code that's on the left here, and I'm going to paste actually the link also in the chat. So if you're, um, if I change page, you know, you click the link in the chat and you're going to be able to see a QR code as well. This will show you this little welcome sign up just placed in your space, right? And, and in this case, because you use the QR code, you're able to um, bypass all the, you know, the geo restrictions here. So, my point being that here is this, you know, an entire end-to-end -end process for publishing content. This is, you know, what we've done here in like the past five minutes is create an experience, give it a location, brought some content in with this little welcome sign, and published it. And that's all there is to it. So the rest in terms of how this gets transformed into 3D content and how this gets anchored on the user and so on, this is what the app does. This is what your channel is responsible for. Just like when you put a video on YouTube, you don't really know, you know how it's streamed, how it's compressed, you know how, the, how you decide which stream to send based on the network uh, quality. Uh, you just load your video, you get a link back and... And now you know you can you can interact or people can interact with it. All right. So with that, uh, using that process, I just want to share some of the things we've seen that are really I think interesting in the academic world. Some of the experiences that um, we've seen um, this year. So I'm going to give you kind of a, a, a range of things. This one has been one of the really pioneer in the area. This is actually the president of Northeastern, President Aoun, who recorded himself, he started in 2021 for the, at the end of the year, uh, recorded himself on green screen and placed himself on the campus for students to be able to take photos with them and just pass, passing them messages, right? So as they were going through the campus for commencement with their family, um, so again, I'm going to to play this again this is kind of him recording himself in the northeastern green screen lab and this is him placed at different locations around the campus so you could see him take photos and so on and then from there uh students starting to produce content themselves so so this is content that was produced by a northeastern student which is one of the kind of iconic murals on the campus uh, by l mac and they kind of retook another, you know, another take at it, made some adjustment using 2D animation. So video animation, there's no 3D knowledge here required. And this is anchored on this mural. So again, it's, it was a way for students to pass messages to, you know, other students about congratulatory messages, but, you know, it could be anything. Um, and then in the last commencements, um, it expanded a little bit. Now all the deans recorded themselves on green screen and you could take a photo with them. So what you see here on the left, on, on the left is, is one of the deans who recorded uh, herself. So they, they had different pauses, giving a diploma, congratulating students and so on. And you could scan codes here and decide which dean you wanted to take a photo with or you wanted to virtually meet. And then you pointed your phone, you see it's an empty Here's the seal of the university. You pointed your phone, and when you pointed your phone, you moved your phone to the left. Voila, you would see the dean uh, right there. And you could, again, take photos and so on. So the campus at Northeastern has been exploring the use of augmented reality um, to augment the campus, so to see how they could communicate with students and staff on campus to place content for special occasions, to open the campus also to students. So now through the immersive lab, they are 
uh, at least 100 students last year went through uh, classes um, that were through um, uh, classes that are not uh, purely AR classes, things like journalism, uh, history, art, who, as part of the curriculum, had a four-week program on immersive media, and they used Hubble. So they created experiences, and so the campus can become a place where you showcase students' work. So it's a way also to open up, you know, uh, byproduct of of a class to 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 the broader public. Um, on the same vein, I wanted to also bring up um, an interesting project that happened in Concord. Concord is a very kind of historical, um, history-rich city in uh, Massachusetts. Um, this is where the Minuteman, you know, park is, and uh, the Concord Academy is a, is a high school that's in Concord, and it started to essentially explore the same idea, but with a, a historical lens. And so it was a collaboration between a history teacher, Kim Frederick, and Ben Stumpf and Tom Corbin, who are managing IT and computer science video classes, some more technical classes. And they collaborated to bring uh, these two disciplines together to essentially place content over the campus for different periods of time. So you had different channels for 20th century, 19th century, 18th century. And so they did a first pass at researching history, and then they, they took those assets and they placed them on campus. And it was the 100th anniversary of Concord Academy. So they used this, you know, when parents came over and alumni to kind of showcase um, showcase the work, basically. And if you see here, that's an example of a, of a, you know, of a space that they've created. So you have historical photographs, you have a 3D model. So again, it's a great opportunity for students to learn a little bit about all these pieces. And you have a green screen recording of one of the students narrating, you know, that particular scene, basically. So it's also a great way for the students to get involved in um, sharing beyond the classroom, you know, sharing with the public, with the parents, with the community, sharing what they're learning, what they're researching, and makes their work more, more valuable, in my opinion. They also collaborate with the local museum. So I think there's opportunity with those projects to also create better ties with the local communities because again the magic comes from the fact that it's relevant to where you are you know you're kind of deepening the engagement with the local community so it could be historical it could be cultural uh, it could be political uh, it could be environmental uh, information um, we, we recently um, uh, worked and collaborated with a, a professor from MIT who worked with a um, an island in Sweden um, in the middle of the Balkan um, Sea that is very polluted. And they were trying to find ways to tell the importance of wetlands that's that's on this, this island. And they work with local school, um, and I'm talking about elementary school and explaining the biology of pollution. And these kids basically drew characters like little monsters that are representing represented this, this particular phenomenon, which uh, were, were then turned into AR elements that were placed on the swamp. So it was a way to kind of embody and, and kind of give a form, a shape to something that's a complex, you know, system um, and kind of blend, if you want, different disciplines in order to create an experience that people can um, can relate to and people can actually act on and, and, and share with the, the general public. So again, I hope we can do on the Concord Academy, I will, you know, my goal would be that we do a deep dive session on their projects, because I think it was really interesting how they did it, how they involved the students. Uh, the whole approach is, is, is really interesting. And that we'll do a separate sessions. So if you're interested, just email us and we'll make sure we send you an invite when we do this uh, this session. And same thing for the projects in in uh, in Sweden. Um, this one is also really interesting from another perspective. This is um, the Holocaust Education Center in Rhode Island that has a monument that's um, very conceptual and um, obviously survivor of the Holocaust. Um, 
you know, are getting really old. And so uh, they wanted to basically um, record some of those survivors telling their story. Um, some of them escaped the Holocaust um, during Crystal Knot. So they left right before things started. Some of them ended up leaving, going to other countries. Some of them are the, the children of people who survived to tell their story. But anyway, they capture those stories on green screens. And the goal is that um, whenever schools go to the memorial, that they have this sense of connection with the actual history, that it's not just an abstract concept, but they can see people narrating stories about their their experience. And you can see here some, it's not live yet, but it's one of the first, you know, there's I think six survivors that have been um, recorded yet. And it's an example of kind of how the experience eventually will look, look like here in somebody's you know room versus at the memorial but uh this is the story of ruth and you know she was 16 and that's her photo of her that appears and she narrates a story of what happened on crystal nap when she was 16 and and it's very poignant very powerful very um 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 you know it's a very um, important piece of work um Again, these are things that can be produced today with without having a you know Hollywood studio at hand. You can produce this with um, you know uh, very minimal work. In fact, I wanted to share with you another one that shows you how low key that that can be. Not that it has to be that, but so that you know again, I, I want to demystify a little bit the complexity here. Uh, this was done. This was the first project that was done uh, uh, by Northeastern. In they had a uh, campus in Toronto that they work with. So they they had this program where they work with nonprofits around Toronto. And one of the projects, all about kind of narrating the story through AR, they filmed uh, residents from a neighborhood that was gentrified and was going to be torn down and replaced with some, you know, condos and everything. And so they asked this, the, the neighbors, the neighbor, people from the neighborhood to tell the story about why this needed to survive. Why the, what was important about this particular neighborhood. And so they all told their story and then they placed these stories. So this woman is talking about the high school, how, you know, how the high school looked like. She went to this high school and it's historical relevance and so on. And again, it's another way to communicate. It's another way to capture stories that I think is very interesting and largely unexplored. Um, but that was kind of their experience. And they set this up, you know, outside without, Again, the goal here wasn't to produce, to do something overly produced. It could be, you know, much nicer and, and better done. But I think it's interesting from the standpoint of the technology taking almost second stage to the narrative, you know, and using the media really to communicate versus being focused on the spatial effect. Um, so... So with that, I'm going to... Uh, yeah, there's one more... Um, one last story I wanted to share with you, uh, and it's um, some work in another domain, which is more um, the music and performance area. So it's Berkeley um, College, uh, the uh, music um, college. And uh, there, this year, uh, we work with them uh, on a... So it was really interesting. It was the first hackathon around immersive media that they organized internally to Berkeley NYC. Uh, and it was a relatively small group, but very focused on how could immersive media transform essentially experiences, especially in particular live experiences. How would we reinvent um, you know, those experiences using, using immersive media? And we're inviting along with uh, Unity and uh, Blender to present. And then what was really fascinating is that some students decided to create uh, experiences that would be played or, or deployed or experienced alongside live songs, live performances. So, and there were two modes that were experimented, one during the actual hackathon, one after that by um, a graduating student. The first one was having QR codes that would be in sync with songs, and each QR code was a space on the channel of this uh, electronic music uh, DJ performing. And then you would have things happening around you. So, so, so the song would actually be augmented with a context, the visual context that would make the experience 
you know, deeper and, and more, more meaningful and more contextualized. And the second one was an actual music performance where each song, um, so it was a singer who had uh, created uh, six environments, six or eight environments, I think it's six, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, but each one of those environments was triggered by a MIDI keyboard that was on stage. So as she pressed certain keys, then the you know the channel would refresh and load this experience. So you would be basically, you wouldn't have to scan a code, you're just holding your phone up. And then something happened that gives you an environment that again would be her contextualization of her song at that particular moment. And again, it was a very interesting experience because you bring in, you, what you can see here is like you're inside like a, um, you know, a subway car, you know, so you would hold your phone inside the subway car and the song starts and, and you're, you're surrounded by the subway car. And again, very much, um, this is the final shape and form this is going to, you know, in this, this is going to get deployed moving forward. I don't know, but as far as an experimentation, it, it is a fascinating new medium and new ex form of experiences that I think are, again, largely unexplored and can now be explored by students without, again, they, having to bring the, the heavy machinery of, you know, content production and, and, and software development. So, so I'll pause right here. I'm sure there will be more coming from the conversation. I just want to open it up to everybody for uh, questions or contribution of things you've done or things you want to share that could add to this conversation. And I'll start reading the thread too. So feel free to jump in. Uh, can I create 3D images for my sculpture with my iPhone 13? Yes, absolutely, Kimberly. That was the point about this. Uh, so I would recommend an app. I mean, it's we have no stake in this. Uh, it's called Polycam. That's something we use often. You just use Polycam. Um, yes, thank you. And that's what Madison responded. Thank you, Madison. That's spot on. Um, does it handle ambisonic sound? So we don't handle ambisonic sound, but we can create um spatial sound so it means that when you play sound in a scene um you play sound around the user as the user moves so they move the phone which is kind of the proxy for their the head basically then the audio is going to be remixed in real time and and be fed to your headphones based on where you're looking or where you're you know what you're doing so it was a very interesting um project that was deployed last month by the LA Master Chorale. So they took a piece, multiple voices, eight voices, and they placed those in a circle around the user. So it's an experience on Hubble. So you, you basically see, you, 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 you hear eight voices and above each voice, they've placed the, the type of voice. So soprano, bass, tenor. And so you can walk to those sound sources and still mixing right so it's still the overall um, harmony is still here but you can now detect from that source what's the tenor what's the you know the soprano what so how those sounds those voices sound so it helps educate the public about the subtleties and how this comes together so it's very very simple but kind of clever way to explore with with audio um remixing very cool that is amazing okay yes 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 again feel free to ask questions um live i don't think i don't think everybody's muted so ron i think you're ron can you can you are you able to i just want to check that there is no yeah i'm unmuted I can hear you. Okay, good. Okay, just want to make sure. Everybody was very quiet, so. Does Havale offer cloud hosting similar to its wall where one doesn't need the app to access the content? No, we don't offer, so we offer cloud hosting. I mean, all your content is in the cloud. So if you deploy an experience, you know, in the middle of a park, it, it, it's it's hosted 
um, on, on Hovelay's server and the phone of somebody is going to that park is going to query the server, say, hey, I'm here, what do you have for me? And it's going to deliver that experience to the phone. But it needs the Hovelay browser, the Hovelay app, which again is, is you know, often call it the browser because it, it's packaged like a browser, works like a browser. Um, so, so yeah, so that's the answer. I'm currently using Hovelay for my art proposal. Thanks, Kimberly. Good to hear. Can I, a user add their own comments, response visual, otherwise to an image produced by someone? Ah, that's a great question. Yes, Ron. Um, so you can make any object interactive. That means you can say that somebody taps, you know, I'm going to take an action. That action could be to pop. There's a built-in web browser in the Hovelay browser, you know, the, the camera browser. So you can pop a form where people can add comments and, and you know, but that's going to be for you to receive. It's not going to be others won't be able to see it unless, you're, unless you republish their comments. Yeah, uh, actually following up on that, what you just said, I think, is there a way, in fact, to allow others to see the accumulated um, reactions to, you know, whatever the core piece is? Not unless you allow that in your experience. Not unless to, it's not something that's a built-in feature. It's something that you would basically have a form that people fill out and kind of a consolidation of all the comments that you want others to see. And then you could have, you could either republish those comments, you know, as a, as a piece of AR, maybe text or or another button that you know people can tap and see the the other comments, just like you know, at the bottom of a YouTube video or something. Uh, how can we make music to visual effects? Um, Kimberly, I'm not sure I understand that questions. Uh, can we do another lessons on audio with Avalay? Yes, I think we should probably do a session. Maybe we'll do something around with some folks from Berkeley where they can talk about what they're doing. Um, or maybe maybe the artist who did this this performance that was augmented, and then we maybe do a deeper dive on on audio. Um, it should be great for my Washington DC students to work to engage them. Yes, that absolutely. Uh, find the content themselves at each site. Okay. Yeah, they could find the content themselves at each site. In fact, the map um, will, you know, they just need to know that there is a channel and, you know, just have, they just have to know that they need to tune this on this channel and then they'll be able to see where, where to go from there. Where on the hub is it show make comments for the artist? So it's not in the app that what I was saying is that this is something you can add as a button, you know, and if you, if you experience with buttons, you will see that those buttons allow for a web, some kind of web component to pop up, which could be a form. Ashish, I think you're raising your hand, right? Okay. Uh, yes. Um, Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, you know, at my university, we've been working with volumetric video, um, very basic uh, entry level using depth kits solution and uh, the, the connect sensors. Um, I'm curious to know if Hubble offers uh, seamless integration of depth kits files that come with the, the data files that accompany the MP4s and so on. So we, we don't right now. Um, we could add that if there is demand. Um, the, the one issue we had with uh, volumetric video was the size of the assets, because uh, usually they tend to be very, very big very quickly. Uh, and so, but, you know, under the right circumstances, if, you know, if it's for at home consumption, when you're on Wi-Fi versus, you know, being somewhere in the street where you don't know what connectivity people have, I think it could be, it could be a, an option. One thing to know is that Hubble is based on Unity. So anything that can run in Unity can most likely run in, in Hovelay. Uh, we, you know, there's an exporter uh, that you can use. Uh, the only thing to, to be aware of uh, is that you cannot export custom scripts. So for instance, for in the case of volumetric video, it would need to be us in, you know, kind of adding those into the, the browser so that it can kind of decode those, those assets. Okay. Um, 
but yeah, so that's that's the short answer. So send me an email, we can look at it. And if, if that's a requirement, you know, again, this, these are things that we, you know, we always consider when we see there is there is demand. And I think the best way to know is just to let us know that this would be useful. So. Any other feedback, questions, experiences you want to share, things you've done that you think could be valuable uh, to? Hey, Nicola, I wanted to comment to Kimberly um, on making music to visual effects on Havale. You can certainly create scenes with, with effects and the audio being added to that specific scene. So you can really place um, um, audio to uh, sync up with the uh, with the visuals. So that's that's something that you can certainly do. Yeah. Nicola, this, this is Kate me. Donovan from Boston Children's. I just want to congratulate you. It, it's been really a privilege to watch the iterations happen and get to a point where it seems to be such an easy solution for folks to build out some AR experiences. Um, I facilitate our teen advisory committee at Boston Children's and our teens are looking for a way to, to get more of that patient experience to some of the kids in the hospital. So we're exploring options and, and this seems like a, an interesting option. So I think uh, maybe there'll be some more grant writing in my future to try to get this in the hospital. But I, I just want to say congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate appreciate your support. And uh, there is, a, if, if you get a chance, uh, I saw there's a trending channel uh, on Havale right now, which is... Uh, and I think Bola, that might be interested for you as well. Uh, it's um, was done by a, um, an artist in Australia where she recorded a Santa on green screen that has very funny story. And its purpose is to allow kids who are at the hospital and cannot go see Santa to have Santa comes to their room. And yeah, I want to thank you for for forwarding that to Jeff and Christmas myself. Wish. Yeah. So yes. for others, if you're interested, you know, if you go to the to the Havale app and look at the global channel, you're going to see Christmas Wish and you're going to see a very funny Santa with an Australian accent. Uh, and um, so that's and that's the purpose is for, you know, to to allow. Um, yeah, children in hospitals to be able to have these these funny experiences. So fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. I, I did see that last week, and I thought it was uh, great. Yeah, I thought about you when I saw it because that, <laughs> that could be, um, you know, interesting with the work you're doing with inmates and you know yeah. and people having access to content, you know, when they can go to the to the outside. Yeah. Thank you. And hello there. Uh, I'm hello. Christopher Robinson. I'm an American Sign Language interpreter. I think. We perhaps worked together some years back in association yes. with the, uh, the the monument, the uh, the Shaw Memorial, the Shaw Memorial, right? Yes, right. Good absolutely. To, good, to, good to see you again. I'm eager to uh, pursue that capability um, even further. Um, I work with uh, like Shakespeare in the Park type events and the possibility of uh, using Hoverlay as a platform to be able to capture and then view sign language interpreters on the stage um, is something we want to, we want to pursue. So I want to, to, to check in with you, but I also want to show my face and say hello again. Yeah, to, absolutely. To yes. Talk about the possibility. Yeah, we should absolutely look into this. I feel there's a great opportunity there. We haven't really Hi, Chris. explored. Um, so yeah, it's so good to see you again. Likewise. I'll, I'll, yep. I'll put my contact information back to there so we can we can loop back. Perfect. That. Yeah, yeah. send us an email or yeah, perfect. Thank Great. you. All right. Any other question, thoughts, comments? Yes, Lori, Kimberly. Okay, just 
Jump right in. Okay, Just, I'm jumping in. <laughs> Hello, it's good to see you, you both. Good to see you too. <laughs> um, so uh, I have a question. <laughs> I have a, a question about um, like how 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 can you like how precisely could you locate something like could you locate something um, like uh, uh, like uh, over a painting or over you, you know like how, how does how does that work? I mean, yep. I, you've you've done so much since the last time I did anything with students with Hoverlay. It's like amazing. My mind is is just blown. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> and what one of my 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 colleague, um, you're going to hear more about this, but we're 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 do, we're gearing up for a project at Berkeley. Okay, great, perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so two of us are here, and there's a third. And um, yeah, we're really excited to talk to you. So, great. But my question's so, about locating, like. Yeah. Much. So it's a great point because I think the the, the thing that um, often we talk about geolocation and you know the map. This is very rough coarse grain placement. This is really about activating yes or no. You know, am I kind of in the ballpark where I need to be? Then once you're inside that zone and to have fine grain placement, you use the other workflow. You know, I showed around the user, you use an image anchor. Image anchor are very precise. And you just need to give the physical size of what the phone is supposed to detect and that you're going to give the image off. And then you can place very precisely content over that. Um, in fact, there is, you know, you can, and it can be small, it can be big, it can be a big mural, it can be a small card, but it can be extremely precise. So it's um, kind of the combination of the two. It's the combination of the uh, two, like yeah. Russian doll. So first is you're kind of in the, in, in the zone where you need to be. Oh, I can have an experience here. Okay. Now the experience loads up. And that helps also kind of break down the, the the size, the sheer size of content that needs to be distributed over, you know, especially doing a tour or multiple stops. You only get the one that's relevant to where you are. And now you can start to have precise placement, you know, within uh, that zone. Um, uh, great, so, thanks. That was the part I wasn't, I was like, yeah, it's, it's this it's, or it's that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I guess I'll um, go. I, I'm Go ahead, Kimberly. Kimberly yeah. Um, I am pretty new to Haverlay. I'm a sculptor and a painter and basically an installation artist. Mm -hmm. And um, I used uh, Haverlay over one of my paintings, commission paintings, and it blew people away so much that the school district contacted me in Virginia and asked me to create some murals and sculptures um yep. and then so it was like I said it was in my proposal so they could see they didn't know if they wanted a four foot or a seven foot sculpture so this way they could play with it and see what they wanted um hmm. I'm really excited very and interesting I, yeah yeah I because the last time I was on one of the these uh, uh sessions I I was amazed but I didn't know how to use it and now hmm you put some ideas in here with the students of what we can do. And I, I think it's amazing. Hopefully I'll be able to go to all the, um, this is a junior high school where they wanna do positive thinking. So, and they wanna do an exhibition. So I'm really stoked. I really wanna thank you. And I just haven't learned enough. So um, hopefully we can do some more tutorials of, I guess how to put audio in there is my biggest question. Yep. Is that, does that need an app? No, or, no, you just add audio to, you know, to the piece, the way you would add the image, you know, what I showed earlier. Um, you know, when I added this welcome image, uh, you can add another object here, which is an audio object. So oh. it's official audio. And now you add an MP3 and, and I don't know if I have an MP3, but if you had an MP, if I had an MP3, uh, let me see. I'm sure I have one somewhere. Um, okay, so let's do this one. Okay, that's the narrative from an artist who talks about a piece. Um, next. Next. And now you have an audio piece, and um, it's going to be specialized in the sense that wherever I place it around the user, so if I place it to the left, 
you know, then it's going to sound that this, the audio is going to come from, you know, if you wear headphones, obviously it's going to hear, you're going to hear audio. So if you scan this code, you're now going to hear a voice, you know, of this artist talking. So wow, you can, oh, wow. You can add those multiple pieces. Um, there is another thing that's coming up too that uh, you'll be able to use pretty soon. And we're actually quite interested in having beta testers called sequences. So you're going to be able to create a narrative. So let's say you want this audio to start only when somebody taps an object or gets close to an object. So we're going to be able to add sequences. You could say, you know, when somebody taps on the, the welcome sign, I want to do play. I want to play the audio, for instance, you know, and you save that. And now you have, you have a narrative. And then when this is done, you can say, you know, I want the, the, the object to exit you know i want the welcome sign now to disappear okay okay so with that that's amazing i can't so, wait for that can we use or do we have to purchase uh famous artist music that's your yeah you 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 got to get licenses for the music okay. or you can get somebody you know to produce the music but you cannot infringe you know any ip right you know, like it's so. Kimberly, we're working with a or with a company that would allow that would have that sort of uh, some sort of a library of music available for uh, for Havali users. So beautiful. It's coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thanks, Kimberly. Uh, Hilda, I think you had uh, a question. Yes. Um, thank you. This is. This is great. I have played with a relay over the last um, bit. So this is my first formal um, discussion in Hoverlay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the chair of the cultural district in Winchester, and mm -hmm. I am envisioning a an um, exhibit sometime next fall that is a combination of real and um, virtual pieces. So, um, and one of the big, because it's a, a, a um, cultural district, one of the important things that we're trying to get to happen is community engagement. Mm. So I would really love to be able to teach um, students or whoever, because not everybody loves sculpture, not everybody loves art. But yeah. what I love about Hoverlay is that we can layer in music, we can layer in spoken word, we can layer in visuals. And um, so my question is, do would you be will, do, does Hoverlay um, provide like classes that I could make available to my community or um is it can perhaps we can have this conversation outside I I love you know that was easy enough for me to be able to jump into and create some rudimentary um images and I was able to test out audio as well as video um but certainly I am completely unqualified to teach a class and I've been hunting for somebody who would be able to teach so we could do perhaps a workshop is that something that you offer yes the short answer is yeah we've done quite a few in fact this year um we we, we launched in October actually uh there's a, a big downtown that got activated with Hoverlate in Los Angeles and they I'm just going to paste the link here, Grand Avenue Augmented, where they placed 40 plus activations um, around downtown LA. Um, they kind of invite involve local businesses, but they, the most important part is they trained local, uh, the local creative community. They did the workshop and all these people, the vast majority, in fact, if all of them are from LA. There's, that's a muralist, Manuan. This is an architect. Uh, that's a performer, Anna Katarina. She actually, somebody from Boston actually was on the Boston Fashion Week uh, who a piece got taken to go there. But the others, you know, there's a poet, Mike the Poet, who wrote poems. Uh, so, and the, the kickoff for this event, for this was a workshop in LA, uh, I think in April to train, you know, 30 people and they started to make proposals. So it was kind of a kind of a, an RFP kind of process. Um, so 
I'll paste the link. But again, I think, yes, that's very much something we can run and, um, you know, I think we can tailor it to whatever is the, you know, your, your particular Great. Need. Great. So um, we can, uh, you, could you paste your contact information? Perhaps we can talk about it. Hilda, I'm, I'm based in Winchester, as a matter of fact. So uh, we Ooh, can. Oh, even better. Let's, ha let's meet for coffee. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Mil Milan, why don't you put, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll put it in the, the chat. Awesome. All right, any other questions? Feel free to jump in. I'm just gonna put the, the link to DTL Augmented if you're interested. It's quite an interesting um, project. All right, well, I think that's it. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, and um, again, uh, to contact us, you can send an email at contact us at Um or, you know, send me an email or Milan and uh, we'll, we'll continue the conversation offline. Thank you.